In our previous lecture, we were talking about uh, the use of quantum mechanics to describe the electron position in the atom. We've talked about the nucleus, and now where the electrons are relative to that nucleus. And we talked about the fact that we can identify each e uh, electron in an atom by its energy by using the four quantum letters that we have previously mentioned, which pertain to the principal energy level, which we define with the letter N, and has numeric values of one, two, three, on up to infinity. We also have another number called the uh, L quantum number, and it has values of zero on up to a maximum value of N minus one. In other words, when N is equal to three, L could have values of zero, one, and two would be its upper limit. We also then said that because of the shape of these uh, energy positions, we could have an orientation factor, and that has values, depending upon, again, the numeric value of L, M can have values of minus L, zero, and plus L. Or, in other words, if L does have a value of two, then M could have a value of um, minus two, minus one, zero, plus one, or plus two. So there are five orientations, or in other words, five equal energy positions that those electrons could be found. Finally, we said that if the atom, or excuse me, if the electron is a particle and it is spinning, then it has associated with it a magnetic field, and they, therefore, we can have a spin quantum number indicated as a plus one half and a minus one half. If you recall from our previous discussion, we also talked about the orbital. The orbital is this volume of space, then, where an electron, which has four quantum numbers describing it, could be found 90% of the time. So we're not saying that the electron is moving in a circle or back and forth or a square or where it's going. We're merely saying that there is a 90% probability of finding it someplace in this space then around the nucleus if it has that particular energy 90% of the time. And we'll use orbitals and orbital pictures to talk a little bit more about molecular geometry a little bit later. Now, <clears throat> Again, just looking at L, because L is what determines the shape of the orbital, we specifically talked about and looked at if we've made a plot with L equals zero into the quantum mechanical equation, we end up with an orbital that we call an S orbital, and it is spherical in shape. And of course, a spherical object would have no orientation associated with it. So therefore, we don't have an orientation factor. When L is equal to one, we talk about a P orbital, which has that figure eight or dumbbell type shape, as we sometimes call it. That's a P orbital. But because L is now equal to one, M, the orientation could be minus one, zero, and plus one, or in other words, there are three of these p orbitals in that L equals one sublevel. And of course, in the previous lecture, we looked at the drawings of these three p orbitals. When L is equal to two, we have a d orbital. Most of the d orbitals had sort of a four lobe structure to them. But again, when L is equal to two, then M could have values of minus two, minus one, zero, plus one, and plus two. So again, five orientations. So there would be five d orbitals. And finally, we talked about L equals to three. The f orbital, we looked at the pictures of them. They were kind of a complex looking mess, and we're really not going to worry about their shape. But we would note that then for the f orbital, because now m, l is equal to three, then m could be 
minus 3, minus 2, minus 1, 0, plus 1, plus 2, and plus 3. In other words, seven f orbitals that we could have. We keep in mind each orbital can contain two electrons, provided, of course, that the spins are different. Now, it is possible then to describe each electron in an atom with four quantum numbers, one for N, one for L, one for M, and one for S. Each electron, in other words, if I'm talking about element 79, I would have 79 sets of four numbers that would describe the 79 different electrons in the gold atom. Well, one of the things that we can say, and this is uh, after a scientist by the name of Pauli, Pauli's exclusion principle, get this up here where we can see it, Pauli's exclusion principle says that no two electrons in the same atom can have the same four quantum numbers. No two electrons can have the same four quantum numbers. Let's look at doing a quantum number one here for helium. Helium's pretty simple. We have two electrons and what we are saying then is that for each of the two electrons in the atom, now we need to write a number for N, a number for L, for M, and for S. And we're going to do that for two electrons. So the first row is in the first principal energy level, so N is equal to 1. And so therefore we would have our first number would be 1. Now when N is equal to 1, L has only one possible value, 0. And M has only one possible value, 0. And the spin could be either a plus 1 half or a minus 1 half. Now I'm not saying which electron would have which, but one would be a plus one half, the other would be a minus one half. So the other electron would have a one, zero, zero, minus one half. This fits Pauli's exclusion principle. In other words, the two electrons do not have the same four quantum numbers. Three of them are the same, but the last one is different. So no two electrons in the same atom can have the same four quantum numbers. At least one has to be different. Now, as you can see, that would be a pretty messy way to have to describe the electrons in an atom. And so a technique called writing the electron configuration has been developed to allow us to show these electrons in a different format. So let's look again at helium, but this time we're going to use what we refer to as an orbital energy diagram. These are showing the various orbitals and increasing energy. So the lowest orbital, the lowest energy in an atom is the 1s. And then we go to a 2s, a 2p, a 3s, a 3p, etc. And you might ask, well, do I have to know how to put these ordered? Because we notice up here we go 3p and then 4s and 3d, that doesn't quite follow. And the answer is no, you don't need to know how to do this. This will be given to you, although in the text you'll find one short cut way that you can do these. And secondly, I will show you how we can use the periodic table actually to do the electron configuration without going through an energy orbital diagram. But it's useful to look at an energy orbital diagram first. So let's start with helium now. And so the first one we want to look at here, helium, two electrons. So we'll put one in and then the second. And I'm using arrows here so that we're showing that the two electrons have opposite spins and therefore they can be in the same orbital. So for helium now, the way we write the electron configuration, we write 1s, and a superscript 2. This says that there are two electrons in the first energy level in the first s orbital. 
That's known as the electron configuration for the helium, 1s2. By the way, the number up here, when we add all of the superscript numbers, should be the same as the atomic number of the atom that we're working with. So this is the electron configuration for helium. Now, one thing that we're going to talk about as we go along, and that is that the electrons in the S and P orbital of highest quantum number, in other words, principal energy level number, are referred to as the valence electrons. And the valence electrons will come in in our discussion in chapter 7 on chemical bonding, where we're going to be taking these valence electrons and try to understand why things chemically combine and why they combine in the particular manner that they do. Well, let's look at another example here of an electron configuration. This time let's pick uh, uh, boron. And so looking at then electron configuration for boron, first of all again we will fill the energy orbital diagram and so boron is element number five. So we need five electrons in. So we'll put one, two, three, four, and then Five. So we've put our five electrons in, and then for boron we would then state that the electron configuration would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p1. Notice that if I add 2 plus 2 plus 1 is 5, which is the atomic number of the boron, which then should correspond. So we see then that we can now look at the electron structure, but now we can also look at that important part of the atom, the valence electrons. And the question is, how many valence electrons does boron have? How many valence electrons does it have? I heard back there, five. Five is correct. No, that's not correct. Five is not correct. Anyone else? A three, that's correct. Because it's just the S and the P of the highest number. This number one doesn't count in valence electrons and so boron has three valence electrons. All right? Now, we'll use the same chart. We'll go on up here and talk about one more element here and that is nitrogen. So nitrogen, we're gonna go seven. We've already put in two, four, and five, and so now we'll go ahead and put in two more for nitrogen. Now, when I put the next two in, I'll put them in here. And notice that I've put them in as singles rather than putting a pair and then a single and an empty orbital. I have half filled each of those orbitals first. This is known as Hund's rule. Hund's rule said that we half fill each orbital in a sublevel before we begin pairing. So we have then three singles instead of any pairs. We half fill, half fill um, a sublevel before pairing. Now, the last thing that we want to do here is write the electron configuration. And so for nitrogen, then we're going to say 1s2, 2s2, 2p3. And how many valence electrons does nitrogen have? And it does have five, that's correct. Five valence electrons. So we see the two and the three. Also, if we add up, three plus two plus two is seven, which is the atomic number of nitrogen, which is then the correct electron configuration. So we can write electron configurations by filling the energy orbital diagram, keeping in mind Hund's rule on, on uh, half filling, and we can 
look at the electron configuration to determine the number of valence electrons. Let's look at the electron configuration now for an element in the third row of the periodic chart. So let's pick uh, element 13, aluminum, and take a look at its electron configuration. Again, here we have our energy levels. Now you might ask, do I need to know how to order these? In other words, jump from the 3P to the 4S, et cetera. Uh, the answer is no. There is a, a little technique given to you in the text of how you can do that to set up an, an ordering. But uh, this will be given to you on an exam if a question is asked so that you do not need to remember how. Or I'll teach you a little shortcut method that we can use using the periodic table itself. We don't have to have anything memorized essentially. All right. So we said we're going to do aluminum, element 13, so we want to put in 13 electrons. Now rather than draw arrows up and down each time, and I'll go ahead, the first one here, I'll put it in as arrows to show that they are uh, paired with opposite spins. From now on, I'm just going to use slashes, so I'll slash one way and then the other to show the two electrons. So we've put in two. <coughs> Three, four, five, six, seven, Hun's rule. I put all those in as halves first. Eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. All right, so now we've got the thirteen electrons making up aluminum that we can put into a written form of an electron configuration. And so for the aluminum then, we would say that its electron configuration is 1s superscript 2, tells us we have two electrons in the 1s, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 2 and 3p1. So that's the electron configuration then of the aluminum. Again, the superscripts should add up to the atomic number of the element that we're doing the electron configuration for. So we have 4, 10, 12, 13, which is correct. Now, how many valence electrons does aluminum have? How many? Three. Three. S and P of the highest level we're in. So aluminum has three valence electrons. In a previous one that we did, using boron, we found that we had an electron configuration of 1s2, 2s2, 2p1, and how many valence electrons did boron have? Three. Notice on the periodic table the location of boron and aluminum. We see that they are in the same column. Elements in the same column are said to be in the same family of elements. It means that their chemistry is going to be very similar. That's one of the important things that we get from electron configuration. The reason boron and aluminum form similar compounds is because they have the same type of valence electron structure. Now, there is another way that we can write the electron configuration and shorten it and it's referred to as the preceding noble gas method. We go backwards on the periodic chart to the preceding noble gas. We see the noble gases are the elements in the last column of the periodic table. So if we go back to right here, this would be the preceding noble gas of neon. In other words, the first 10 electrons are taken care of in there. And so the way we can write aluminum then is to write 
aluminum. Actually, we don't write the AL. I'm putting that down just so that we know which one we're working with. The electron configuration would be shown as brackets NE. So in other words, we're saying that we're starting with the neon core of electrons, which is 10. So we just put a little 10 up there. So we don't need to tell where all of the other electrons are. Those 10 are in the lower levels of where neon's electrons would be. And then we would put neon 10 and then 3s2, 3p1. This is referred to as the preceding noble gas method. Yes, a question back there. You do not have to put the 10 up there. I put it up there just so that we can keep track, make sure that we've got the 13 electrons in for the element. It is not necessary because obviously one could just look at the periodic chart and see neon's number is 10 and know that it represents the first 10 electrons. In most cases, if you saw an electron configuration with using the preceding noble gas, you would not see the little 10 above the neon. I put it in there, as I said, merely so that we can check ourselves as we go along to make sure that, in fact, we have the correct number of electrons in there. All right? So the question was, do we need that 10 up there? The answer is no, we do not need the 10 above the brackets for the neon. So this is the method that we're normally going to use, is the shorthand or the preceding noble gas method. Let's go along here. Here's aluminum then, and let's now take a look at Let's look at argon. Argon then is <coughs> element 18. And so we're going to put in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. As a matter of fact, keep in mind that this right here represented neon up to that point. Now we'll go ahead and we'll put in eight more electrons for the uh, uh, argon. So 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, actually they should have been half filled, 15, 16, 17, 18. So we now have argon. Now to write the electron configuration for argon then, we would say that it is bracket neon, <coughs> and 3s2, 3p6. That would be the electron configuration using the preceding noble gas for argon. But there's something here that I really want to point out that I hope that you would see here. As a matter of fact, let's go back here and draw one more line. If we draw a line right here, we have this. Notice that whenever we fill the S and the P of the highest level we're in, we are at a noble gas. In other words, when the 2S and the 2P have been filled, we're at neon. When the 3S and 3P has been filled, we're at argon. When the 4S and the 4P are filled, we will be at krypton. Every time we fill the S and the P orbitals, which are the valence orbitals, at that highest level, we end up with a noble gas. Now, the noble gases are noble because they don't tend to want to react very well. They are aloof. They do not tend to chemically combine. And one of the characteristics of all the noble gases is that they have eight valence electrons. The one exception would be helium. Helium has only two valence electrons. That's all it can have because then it's already filled and we have to start a whole new level. So we had a question over here. Yeah, you keep talking about 4P. Does that come after the 3D? It comes after the 3D. That's correct. This, this one doesn't go up that far. But yet we can keep going and going until we had sevens up there, seven S and, and so on, okay? 
we're only going to concern ourselves with about the first uh, 36 elements anyway. So yes, we should have one more group up here, and let's go ahead and add that then. 4P, which we would have then three more additional blocks for the 4P. If we now go ahead and let's, let's go one more example here and let's do uh, iron, element number 26. We've, we have 18 in, so we'll go ahead and leave that. And now we'll go ahead and add then number 19 and 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. Remember Hun's rule, we half fill all of them. And then we paired up 26. Does it make any difference which one I put the pair in? No, these are just for our own bookkeeping purposes. Doesn't mean anything. So now we see then for iron, if we're going to write the electron configuration, iron now has an electron configuration, brackets argon. That's the preceding noble gas that was filled right here. And then 4s2, 3d6. Now the question is, how many valence electrons does that iron have? Somebody said eight. How many valence electrons does the iron have? Two. What are valence electrons? Electrons in the S and P of the highest number we're in. That's all, just the S and P. We're in the fourth column. We're our, our first fourth row. We've already started N equals four. And so only the 4S and the 4P would be valence electrons. There aren't any in the 4P, so the only two would be down here. So that would be iron. If we went on up and did, a, I said that was, this was the last one. I fibbed, we're gonna do one more. We're going to do gallium, element number 31. So for 31, we're already at 26. 27, 28, 29, 30, and add one, 31. And if we're going to do then the electron configuration now for gallium, element number 31, we would have the brackets, start with the preceding noble gas, AR, and then 4S2, 3D10 and 4P1. And that would be then the electron configuration for the gallium. <coughs> this 10 out here I should scratch off so we don't confuse that with part of it. All right. How many valence electrons does gallium have? How many valence electrons did aluminum have? How many valence electrons did boron have? Right. Look at where they are. Boron, aluminum, gallium, three in a row. They all have similar chemistry because they all have similar valence electrons. All right. All right, let's go on and take a look here at some Do this here quickly. Where's the chat? There we are. This just shows the electron configuration and the orbital energy diagram corresponding to the first 10 elements. These 10 elements are listed in your book as well, shown. The only difference is instead of stacking them left to right, it shows them as increasing uh, energy uh, diagram, but showing the same information. And again, here we notice neon has this complete S and P, and that's the noble gas, eight valence electrons. When we got back to helium, it can only have two because that completed the first row, and so it's the noble gas. But eight is going to be the clue as we get into chapter seven. Eight valence electrons is what things are going to be trying to achieve. Yes? That 
The question was, as I understand it, on the previous transcript between the S and the P here, and what is the question then? Oh, yes. There would still be the possibility of eight valence electrons, two here and, of course, six up there. But this time we would have these ten Ds in between. So in, in the fourth row of the periodic chart now, if we look, there aren't just eight elements, but there are 18 elements. Two plus ten more plus six more possible. And if we look at the periodic table, we have the two elements. These are actually the 4S elements. Then we have 10 elements. These are all formed as we put in D electrons. And then as we go across, we would begin putting in the 4P as we did here for gallium and the remainder. And when we filled that 4P, we would now have eight valence electrons and we should have a noble gas which we do, we have krepton, okay? All right, and everybody knows what krepton is and what it's used for. It's the, the only element known on Earth to render Superman useless or harmless or, or weak or whatever the case might be. So if you have some krepton, you can control Superman. Another question. Row five and six will also have D's in them. That's correct. As we go and build these up further and further, the next, the next thing that we would have to have, remember I said that once we filled an S and a P, we can't put any more electrons in until we start the fifth, our new row. So after the 4P, after argon, I mean after krepton, our next here would be the 5S. So we have to start that next row of the periodic chart. And we'd go 5s, we'd go 4ds, we'd have 10 elements in the middle again, and then end up with 5p. So if we take then uh, krypton and add 18 more, we're at element 54, and that would be a noble gas once again. All right? Now, <clears throat> here are <clears throat> electron configurations, not the orbital energy diagrams, but merely the electron configuration for the first 36 elements on the periodic chart. You don't need to have these memorized, but I want to point out a couple of characteristics here. Let's take, for instance, element number three, lithium. All right. 1s2, 2s1. Lithium has how many valence electrons? Just one. We go down here and we take element number 11 and we look at its electron configuration. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. How many valence electrons? One. Lithium and sodium should be alike chemically. If we look on the chart, we see lithium and sodium are directly under each other in a periodic chart. They are in the same family. If we take fluorine, element number nine, and we look at its electron configuration, 1s2, 2s2, 2p5, it has seven valence electrons. If we look at chlorine, We have a 3s2, 3p5, we have seven valence electrons. Chlorine and fluorine should be alike. As a matter of fact, if we go over here to number 35 and look at its electron configuration, we have a 4s2, 4p5, it has seven valence electrons. So each of those three elements Fluorine, chlorine, and bromine have the same number of valence electrons. Sure enough, there they are on the periodic chart in the same family, in the same column of elements. And again, stressing the fact that when we have that eight, 
every time that S and P is filled, then we come in with the noble gas. There's neon, 2S2, 2P6. Argon, 3S2, 3P6. And finally over here, krypton, 4S2, 4P6 for eight valence electrons. So for some reason, having eight valence electron gives a great deal of stability to an atom. As a matter of fact, we'll see in chapter seven that this is the major driving force in chemical bonding is for atoms involved in the chemical reaction to achieve an octet, eight valence electrons. Okay. Now, I said that I would show you a little shorthand method that we can use for writing electron configurations. We'll just use this particular one first, and I have another one that, that we'll look at also. These are color-coded. Notice this light violet color is called the S block. In the center here, we have this salmon color, which would be the D block. Over here, we have an aqua color group, or the P block, and these down here are called the F block. Now, if we look at the periodic table here then, we see that the first two columns are the S, and then these in the center are the Ds, and these six over here are the Ps, and the Fs are pulled out separately. F occurs when L is equal to three. Remember, that's a possible sublevel that we can have. They're pulled out of the periodic chart primarily because if we plugged them in, here and here, of course, the whole periodic chart would have to be extended way over there to put those 14 elements in the periodic chart where they would normally occur. That's why they're pulled out that way, merely to keep the chart a practical length. Now, one of the other things you'll note, if you look up there, is that the S and the P always corresponds to the row that it's in. 1S, 2S, 3S, so on. So they're always whatever row they're in. But notice that the D is always numbered one row, or one number less than the row it's in. So if I'm in the fourth row, and in the D, this is a 3D, not a 4D. And the Fs, if we ever do get down in there, which you won't need to worry about because we won't ask you any of those, but if you ever did want to write it, the Fs are two numbers behind the row that they would fit in. For instance, the first one would be this row right here. This is the sixth row, so this would be 6S, and then we would be talking about a 5D, one less, but this one would fit in here now as the F, so this would be then the 4F, two numbers behind the row that it's in. Now, let me show you how I can use this chart then to do the electron configuration for any element that I want to pick. Somebody pick an element uh, for me right here. Give me a just pick an element beyond 80, let's say. Uh, HG, mercury, we're gonna do mercury, okay, number 80. So, I'm going to do the electron configuration for element 80, which is right here on the chart. That's HG and I'm starting right over here. And this is my preceding noble gas. I already have that. So the preceding noble gas, going back from 80, would be brackets, element 54, xenon. I'm gonna write the 54 up here just so that we show that our numbers add up to 80. All right, I now start into the sixth row of the periodic chart. So I'm gonna have a 6S2, because I'm gonna go that block and that block. I have to move all the way over to number 80. Then I'm going to go into the five Ds. 
But once I get here into the 5D, I'm going to jump out here into the 4F. So actually, I'm going to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So I'm going to have 4F14. And then the 5D, I'm going to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And now I've written the electron configuration for mercury. Electron configuration for mercury is xenon 6s25d10 4f14. How many valence electrons does mercury have? Two. The only electrons that are valence electrons are the s or the p of whatever the highest number is that you're at. We're at six. So we can merely use the periodic chart to do the electron configuration. All right. Let's look at one other here and use the chart. Uh, this one's a little more open, so it might be a little easier to, to uh, see the numbers here. By the way here, I'm just mentioning, uh, and I think we've mentioned these terms before, but once again, the, some of the elements have family names. The first row of the periodic chart are referred to as the alkali metals. The second row of the periodic chart are known as the alkaline earth elements. On the other side, the very last row is referred to as the noble gas elements. And the row next to that, the seventh row, are the halogens. Fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine are the halogens. I'm, I'm pretty sure these are terms that we have already used to describe those. For instance, we talked about the halogens reacting with organic compounds to make halogenated hydrocarbons. And we talked about chlorine and fluorine to make freon, for instance. All right? Um, the elements down here, 58 through 71, are sometimes referred to as the rare earth elements. And the very last row of the, the elements down here, the 5F, are often referred to as the man-made elements. As a matter of fact, beyond number 93, none of the elements beyond 93 have ever been found in nature just as an element. These have all been produced by nuclear reactors, all right? In other words, that we do bombardment, atomic bombardment, nuclear bombardment, and make new elements. And all of these elements beyond number 93 are only found where we're using nuclear reactors and bombardment to produce those. So they're referred to as the man-made elements, again, because they haven't been isolated. Let me just real quickly give me one extra moment here, if you would. Let's just one more quick one, nickel, here just to show the use of this table. So nickel element 28. So for nickel, then we go to the preceding noble gas, which is argon. That's 18. Now we're in here, so we go the first two steps into the 4S, so 4S2. We're up to 20, and we want it to go to 28, so we go uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 spots there to get to number 28, so 3D8. So we can use the periodic table, just remember the S, the D, and the P block, and we can do it, okay? Tomorrow, then we'll talk just a little bit more about the periodic table and some periodic trends in the elements and begin our discussion of Chapter 7 on chemical bonding.